Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar on the role of digital technologies in accelerating European chemical industries transition to reach 2050 goals. Apologies for a slight delay in starting this webinar. We, we had a, a minor technical glitch, but I hope it's, uh, everything is working uh, now. My name is Maria linkova -Ness. I'm a Civic Communications Director, and I'm going to be moderating today's session. So before we start, and we have quite a busy program today, a few housekeeping rules. We've got 90 minutes for today's webinar. Uh, in the first 45 minutes, we're going to hear six speakers um, make their presentations on the role of digital tech um, and uh, green transition. And then the next 45 minutes will be dedicated to a panel discussion between all participants. Um, but the panel debate will be informed by the questions from you the audience. So I would like to ask everybody to use the Q&A box uh, in the right hand side of the screen to post your questions um, to the panelists. You can also vote for each other's questions and of course we'll try to prioritize the questions that receive most votes to inform our debate. So today we're going to talk about digital technologies and um, the idea to organize this webinar came when the CEFIC team was working on the first ever groundbreaking report on digital technologies and I hope everybody has already read this report. If you haven't, please go uh, on our website, download the copy and read it because this is the first, uh, the first ever report that really outlines the status and the progress with uh, implementing digital technologies uh, in the chemical industry. I'm also happy to have two co-authors of this report with us today. It's uh, Daniel Without, our Executive Director Innovation, and Marina Somolova, Innovation Manager in the CEFIC. Uh, and they're going to give you, obviously, the, the gist of the report and the key conclusions that they come uh, with when they were, they were writing this report. Then we're going to hear about uh, some concrete case studies of using some of the technologies also mentioned in this report in chemical industry. Uh, we are very delighted to have today with us Sarah Eckersley from Dow and uh, Nicole Graf from BSF. They're going to give us some concrete examples of how they use uh, tech in their work. And then uh, we'll move to the European Commission speaker. We have with us today uh, Dr. Ilias Yakovidis from DigiConnect. Um, and then we also have uh, Dr. Federico Mena, CEO of EIT Digital, which is a European organization to promote digital innovation and entrepreneurial education. So as you can see, quite a, quite a busy uh, a panel. It's going to be a very content-rich webinar. So I urge you definitely to get pen and a paper to take down some notes. Uh, please use the Q&A box uh, to post questions. And I'm going to pass the floor to Daniel Without, uh, CEFIC Executive Director of Innovation, to set the scene um, and give us uh, his vision on the role of digital in the green transition of our industry. Daniel. Yeah, thank you, Maria. And good, good afternoon to everyone, also from my side. I'm very happy to join this conversation, to be here together with you. I'm very impressed of the panelists, of the distinguished speakers we have, of their expertise, and I'm looking forward for the panel discussion with you. I'm also very happy to have uh, so many of you online and um, look forward to, to engage with you here and uh, feel free to, to ask questions. Before we go into the study, before we dive into the details, uh, let me allow you to set the scene to give you a little bit of uh, background innovation, background information, sorry. Um, You've heard about that the chemical industry is going through a double twin transition, a green transition and a digital transition at the same time. And if you look at policies or if you hear look at this wording, you might think, well, that is kind of uh, two parallel uh, transitions, uh, the green one and the digital one. However, we believe that uh, these transitions are interlinked, that this, uh, that we believe digital technologies will boost um, and accelerate uh, achieving our sustainability uh, goals. And therefore, we have done this, uh, this study, Digital Technologies for Sustainability in the Chemical Industry, where we highlight how advanced the chemical industry is already. We have several case studies there, and you will hear today two case studies from, from Dow and BSF already showing um, how advanced um, the industry is. On the other side, it's um, 
it's uh, yeah it's not only the leading players in the industry there's a lot of potential there's a lot of challenges and if you look at like on topics like uh, like data sharing or cyber security and you see that these topics cannot be managed by a single company alone that we have to work together and that's why i'm very happy to have this uh, discussion here with you and uh, together with industry policy makers uh, but I don't want to go into to, uh, to the details. Uh, this will, will be done by my co colleague uh, Ma Marina. Marina is the specific expert on advanced digital technologies. And she's also the main author of um, the studies. And I believe she will be very happy to share with you insights, uh, the main insights of our study here with you. With this, I would like to hand over then to Marina. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for the uh, introduction. And uh, hello to everyone. Um, I am Innovation Manager at CEFIC, working in close relation to the uh, European digital policies uh, and digitalization of uh, the chemical sector. And I'm glad to present today the highlights of our recent study on digital technologies for sustainability in the European chemical industry, done in collaboration with Arthur De Little. Um, next slide, please. Um, to implement uh, the agenda of the European Green Deal, uh, chemical industry needs to uh, go through a so-called double twin transition. It needs to uh, become climate neutral, uh, it needs to become circular, uh, it needs to innovate uh, towards uh, safe and sustainable chemicals and also transform digitally. And digitalization holds the key to achieving uh, many uh, sustainability objectives. Uh, in the uh, past years, uh, the chemical sector has increased its uh, digitalization rate significantly to become innovative, uh, to become more um, efficient and sustainable. Uh, but clearly, uh, much uh, more needs to be uh, done uh, in terms of uh, deployment of uh, digital technologies across the value chain to accelerate uh, this uh, transition. And with this study, we wanted to identify where exactly in uh, the uh, value chain and how specifically uh, digital technologies um, are expected to contribute uh, the most to the uh, major uh, sustainability objectives uh, in the chemical industry and also identify non-technical priorities uh, essential for an impactful implementation of digital technologies in the chemical sector. And the outcomes uh, of the uh, study are based on um, a number of interviews uh, from uh, digital and uh, sustainability experts from the chemical industry, um, roundtable discussions uh, with uh, digital experts outside of the chemical sector to bring the uh, cross-industry perspective, and the chemical industry survey where companies um, from our industry uh, of different sizes and from di different uh, chemical segments uh, indicated sustainability uh, priorities which in their view could be addressed uh, with the help of uh, digital technologies. Next slide please. So um, based, uh, based on the research, uh, in fact uh, digital technologies uh, can uh, contribute to uh, all sustainability objectives and across the entire value chain and uh, especially in production uh, for the reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Also, the uh, concept of circularity enabled by digital technologies is gaining momentum in the chemical sector, and more and more focus is being uh, placed on um, feedstock uh, and energy uh, management. Also, research and innovation activities uh, can strongly benefit from digital technologies. So this matrix really demonstrates uh, that the uh, chemical industry is uh, already putting considerable efforts uh, into applying digital technology across uh, the value chain, but clearly much wider and more broader implementation would be required to accelerate the transition towards our sustainability objectives. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, based on the uh, responses uh, we received from both small and large uh, chemical companies, we managed to identify our uh, top five um, most prominent uh, sustainability priorities where implementation of digital technologies is expected to have the uh, major impact. Uh, the first one is um, covering uh, sustainability, uh, sustainable uh, process design and um, 
optimization and production, uh, efficient use of uh, energy and resources, um, and uh, integration of alternative uh, feedstock and renewable energy. And this is where uh, technologies such as um, IoT uh, sensors, uh, digital uh, twins, production sites, and also AI-enabled uh, predictive maintenance uh, play a major role. Then we have uh, sustainability assessments, uh, the um, calculation, uh, monitoring, and transparency of scope one, two, and three uh, emissions uh, are facilitated by uh, various uh, digital tools. Uh, then we have a sustainable uh, product design, um, and uh, this is where AI and uh, eventually uh, high computing capacities such as a uh, supercomputer and eventually a quantum computer will uh, play a significant role to, um, to make uh, the uh, product design phase uh, much, much faster and bring uh, the products to the market. Then we have tracking and tracing of materials uh, and chemicals uh, to enable uh, circularity. And here, um, chemical industry uh, is experimenting quite a lot with the blockchain, but also other um, means to uh, share data across uh, multiple stakeholders. And finally, we uh, have uh, safe and efficient logistics and distribution. And also here, uh, we have a broad range uh, of technologies uh, used uh, to uh, facilitate uh, this uh, type of activities. And of course, uh, as a horizontal enabler, uh, we, uh, we have a need for high quality data available and also data sharing mechanisms, uh, which are the uh, essential elements uh, to drive uh, digital transformation. Uh, next slide, please. So we see that um, in the coming years, uh, all digital technologies contributing to sustainable development in the chemical sector are expected to increase in importance, and especially artificial intelligence, big data, digital twins, and blockchain and uh, other data sharing uh, mechanisms, while uh, the most utilized technologies uh, will remain uh, the uh, modeling and simulation techniques, uh, also AI and uh, data sharing uh, platforms. Next slide, please. To further drive uh, the uh, green transition of the chemical industry and accelerate uh, deployment of uh, digital technologies, a number of challenges must be addressed. and. Uh, Overcoming these issues would bring not only uh, sustainability uh, benefits, but uh, business benefits as well, such as uh, innovativeness, uh, efficiency, effectiveness, and uh, obviously uh, competitive advantages. And here uh, we cluster the challenges highlighted by the industry into four clusters. Uh, from the uh, technological side, uh, the uh, most mentioned challenges are uh, data availability, uh, standardization, uh, interoperability, and cybersecurity aspects. On the organizational side, um, uh, there is a concern about losing the uh, competitive edge, and uh, there is a need to uh, protect the intellectual property and the confidential business information. And of course, we have um, required uh, financial commitments and uh, digital skills to uh, drive this digital transformation of the uh, chemical sector. And here we shall not forget about the uh, carbon footprints of the digital technologies uh, themselves. Uh, next slide, please. So based on the findings uh, from the study, uh, we uh, prepared um, uh, a set of high level uh, recommendations, uh, which uh, of course will be further uh, developed um for both the chemical industry and the european institutions um so first of all uh since this uh transition impacts not only the uh chemical sector but other industries as well uh, we would highly encourage uh the uh, chemical companies to broaden the uh collaboration uh, across ecosystems and see what can possibly be done uh collectively in uh in um from the uh, technological perspective, for instance, on data management, on um, required IT infrastructure, interoperability aspects, uh, and cybersecurity, then there is a need to establish uh, common data and uh, technology standards to make sure that the chemical sector shares sustainability attributes with other industries. Um, well, since uh, this uh, transition uh, comes with uh, uh, major disruptions, uh, we are also encourage uh, the chemical companies uh, to start exploring new business models and try to anticipate uh, possible challenges. 
uh, we'll also touch upon uh, on the uh, required uh, investment uh, with a long term vision uh, to achieve sustainability and circularity objectives and the need to attract uh, digital professionals because these uh, digital skills are on very high demand nowadays and the uh, industry needs to position itself as an innovative and attractive uh, industry um, to also be able to compete with uh, other sectors and high tech companies. Then uh, we would encourage broader adoption of digital technologies uh, in the chemical sector through uh, best practices, uh, like, uh, for example, the ones included in our reports, uh, the success stories uh, on how digital technologies can be applied for sustainability uh, in the uh, chemical sector and explain why the change actually needs to occur. And uh, of course, we would like to uh, work uh, even closer with the European uh, institutions uh, to make sure that the uh, chemical industry uh, is um, aligned and well positioned uh, with respect to the uh, European digital policies, regulations and uh, supporting instruments. And our ask uh, to the European institutions would be to ensure an innovative, innovation uh, friendly uh, environment, uh, because this is um, important for the uh, success of uh, digital solutions uh, so that um, there is uh, a need for uh, such a policy and regulatory framework uh, that uh, facilitates uh, deployment of digital technologies uh, contributing to sustainable development. Then uh, we also ask uh, to facilitate the creation of data standards and data sharing uh, mechanisms uh, across ecosystem, uh, which would give uh, more confidence um, to uh, the companies developing uh, digital tools uh, and uh, implementing new business models. And finally, um, we would like uh, to see uh, some uh, risk sharing uh, measures uh, for the uh, companies developing digital tools and also the uh, smaller companies in the chemical sector uh, to navigate this uh, digital uh, transformation. And with this, I would like to uh, conclude uh, my presentation. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention and I would be happy to address any questions uh, in the Q&A session. Thank you. Arthur D. Little. Um, I'd like to invite our next speaker on stage, and I'm, uh, we're delighted to have today our colleague from Dow, Sarah Eckersley, who is going to talk to us about artificial intelligence. And obviously, this is the topic that is now, uh, I think, a hot subject in discussions in absolutely all industries and sectors across the board. Um, and it's really uh, great to, to know that the chemical industry has been doing great strides already for, for years to implement artificial intelligence uh, in our work. So, uh, Sara, would you tell us more about uh, how you use AI uh, efficiently in your product and process design in DAO? Absolutely. Hello, everybody. And, and thank you to Sefik for the invitation to participate in this important dialogue. I'd like to start by just introducing myself briefly. Uh, I have responsibility for research and development for a business group at Dow. And I also have done uh, a lot of work um, over the past five years or so around digital approaches to accelerate uh, adoption of technology at customers. So my topic today is focusing around the utility of AI in bringing new innovations to market and with a particular emphasis on uh, new sustainable uh, innovations. I think that we have a real opportunity in, uh, in the chemical industry to embrace the potential of data and digital technologies to innovate new and sustainable chemistries and products. Moving on. So uh, I'd like to emphasize the word new when it comes to sustainable solutions. So in order to bring uh, new solutions forward, by, almost by definition, we are going to be doing things that are new. New chemistry, new processes, and as was just mentioned, uh, this will include new value chain collaborations. And when we do something new, there is an, an intensity of uh, investment and, uh, and work 
uh, that's required because bringing new things forward is complex uh, in its in its execution and uh, the work involved. Just to give an example of what that looks like doing our more traditional uh, mode uh, of innovation. If we are bring in our traditional um, research and innovation processes, it would typically take something on the order of 10 years or so to bring a new chemistry platform from the time when we first invent and reduce to practice in the lab through the time that we've actually scaled it up fully to be able to be supplying uh, those materials at, at scale. Even the most simple products uh, that you see around you um, have uh, a great deal of complexity in their uh, design and execution. And I'm going to talk in a few minutes uh, about the example of uh, decorative paints, which everybody will likely have uh, on the wall in the room that they're sitting in. Just a what seems on the surface to be a simple product like that um, easily takes two years and a lot of data to bring to uh, market. And then a third example um, would be implementing polyurethane chemistry in uh, commercial uh, in insulating panels in commercial buildings. Just to actually go online and collect the data during the fabrication process of those panels, we might collect over 30,000 data points and uh, be monitoring and uh, adjusting 50 uh, variables. And so uh, even in let's call it the old traditional mode of bringing products to market, there is a tremendous investment in data and that data is incredibly valuable because at the end of the day, it allows us to make the right decisions to bring safe and effective products to market. Next, please. So because that data has so much value, inspired organizations are really investing to harness that data richness to turn it into knowledge wealth. And I'd like to use uh, the example of um, a predictive capability that we've developed in Dow's polyurethanes business called predictive intelligence. Polyurethane chemistry um, is something that we've been practicing for, for decades. We have a great deal of experience formulating um, custom polyurethane solutions that are used by customers in their products. Things like that insulation that I mentioned or uh, bedding or, or the interior of a car seat, for example. So once the products are in the final form, they look fairly simple and straightforward, but there's actually a lot of very complex chemistry and engineering that's going on in those products. The, the chemistry is, uh, is is a reactive chemistry, so it's a multi-component complex chemistry. When we're when the article the chemistry is being used, it often go, undergoes foaming, and at the same time, you might be filling a mold, uh, for example. So lots of complex things going on. And because we have uh, such a data-rich environment, we created predictive intelligence by integrating the lab data chemistry fundamentals, process models, our own scientist expertise, which remains critically important, and uh, combined it all into a predictive model, which can ultimately um, give you uh, and our, provide our customers with a starting point formulation in seconds of digital uh, modeling. So we can focus all of that data power into a single customer interaction to design a product that's tailored for them with obviously increased speed to market. But as noted in the Cephic report, harnessing that data richness is actually a really challenging and intensive journey. Um, you have to uh, do many things in order to get to the point where you can actually do AI and do prediction. You have to acquire all that data from all of the labs around the world and harmonize it between different teams that may not be doing things exactly the same way using exactly the same methods. You have to structure that data so that it can be used for modeling. And sometimes that data comes from disparate sources. And ultimately, you need to implement new processes and new ways of working that, that change the way people work. 
and requires change management, and it also requires new digital skills, as was also uh, highlighted in the report. But the result is well worth the journey um, because it gives us tools that transform the way we work and can collapse the timeline to develop new product solutions. And ultimately, the opportunity to pl apply those, to, to those tools for urgent sustainability programs. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I'd like to talk about four programs uh, from Dow that I think really exemplify the potential of digital to deliver sustainable outcomes. Some of these programs are very well developed uh, and others are still under development. And I think that this illustrates just how fast moving this opportunity space is. I'd like to start with the example of Paint Vision, which was developed by our coatings business and is an online tool for formulating paints and coatings. And, and it can be used by formulators of all skill levels um, and actually around the world. We've launched it in all geographies. It, it may not be obvious on the surface, but a even the simplest paint, even the simplest decorative paint or coating could contain up to 15 ingredients or more, each having a very specific function in, in the paint. One of the um, major ingredients that, uh, that a paint contains is a white pigment called titanium dioxide. Titanium dioxide, excuse me. This is used um, to make the paint opaque. So the reason your paint is white is because it contains titanium dioxide. It also happens to be one of the highest carbon footprint ingredients in, in a paint or coating. So there's a driver to, uh, to uh, replace at least part of that titanium dioxide with alternatives. And we do this with a material called opaque polymer. And as part of the Paint Vision platform, we've developed a tool called Optionizer, which allows the formulator to design paint formulations both for properties, for performance properties, and for cost, but also for carbon footprint reduction. So by replacing part of the TiO2, they can immediately and automatically calculate the carbon emission reduction of, of that paint that they've designed. And then they can go into the lab and reduce it to practice. The, the second example that I'd like to give is called Smart Search. When somebody is doing innovation and starting a, a new program, one of the things that they're often doing is new product uh, innovation. And Smart Search helps them identify and prioritize compounds from the catalog of known chemicals, which is called the Chemical Abstracts Database. Um, Chemical Ab Abstracts Database contains over 250 million materials. And Smart Search allows for an intuitive search that searches on properties, chemical structures, hazard phrases, and whether or not the, um, the ingredient is commercially available. And, and it does this in seconds. And we've started to use smart search to help us in, in selecting starting materials for programs that are the most sustainable. And we've actually used this in looking for uh, potential replacements of materials of concern. So we're very excited also by the fact that Smart Search won a CIO 100 award this year, and it also won an Edison Gold Award for uh, AI optimized productivity. The third example um, that I'd like to use is a tool called Prox. Crop Solver, which is also an online tool that's used to accelerate the development of new agricultural uh, chemicals. So customers can use advanced filters that helps them identify inert ingredients to create an agricultural formulation that's tailored to their specific needs. It's live in North America today. It's going to be available in Europe and Latin America later this year or early next year. And we're starting to add uh, future version features to, to Crop Solver, which will allow the formulator to uh, select also based on sustainability attributes. So a great example of this um, th that we're adding soon is uh, organics certified uh, based on the USDA organics program.
The, the last example uh, that I'd like to come back to is uh, predictive intelligence. So again, we're using this to, uh, to do uh, AI-enabled uh, formulation design for, uh, for, polyure for polyurethane materials. And we're starting to deploy it to help with the adoption of circular renewa polyols. These are polyols that um, are created by recycling end-of-life mattresses. So we, we would call them circular polyols. So they're based on uh, the familiar polyurethane chemistry, but we come back to this topic of newness again. They're not exactly the same as uh, all of the existing polyols, so they require new formulations. And with that comes the need for all of the data intensity that I described earlier. So we're building on the formulation models that we created with predictive intelligence to recommend formulations using the new uh, Renuva circular polyols so that they can be uh, taken into uh, familiar polyurethane foam um, <clears throat> applications. So we can zoom into formulations that meet customer needs, model key property interactions, ultimately fine tune those formulations and recommend starting points to, to our customers. So with predictive intelligence, we're extending the formulation space to allow the adoption of these circular uh, materials, taking advantage of all that data investment that we made previously and those models that we created previously to speed up real world sustainable solutions like, like Renuva. Next, please. So th that concludes uh, uh, the comments that I have. I think that we have a tremendous opportunity to use AI uh, to really accelerate the adoption of sustainable solutions, but we're still very early in that journey and there's, there's a lot of exciting work remaining to do and thrilled to have uh, Dow and colleagues who are on the phone be part of driving that journey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for this very exciting outlook that you, you provided. Well, one of the, I think, most fre frequently used words in your presentation was, was data. And uh, as we also heard from Marina, that uh, data sharing is key to the whole digital and industrial transformation. So I'm delighted to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Nicole Graf from BSF. Um, he's going to share with us the best practices of data sharing in, uh, in her company, because I think that's the question that definitely um, is interesting for all of us. And this is sometimes one of the barriers that is, has been identified also in the report. So I'm um, very excited to hear, Nicole, from you on how you um, managed to solve this, this problem with BASF. Yeah, so thanks, Maria. So yeah, I said my name is uh, Nicole Graf. And in BSF, I um, had a team working on digital solutions for circularity. I joined the company in 2012, and before I had the pleasure to work 10 years in the fast-moving consumer goods uh, uh, industry, so with P&G and with Racket Bank Kieser, and I'm a physical chemist by training. And yeah, the request for today was that I introduce you to um, the data sharing challenge, and definitely you will face this challenge when you want to transform your company towards yeah, circular economy. Next slide, please. So what is meant by this data sharing challenge? And I want to explain this with um, examples. You might have come across um, an application called mCycle. It's um, made by some of my colleagues. And this, um, if not, no problem, I quickly explain. Um, this application allows to orchestrate waste streams. And the waste stream we are talking about here is um, cut off of um, Styrodur panels. Styrodur is a brand of BSF. It's um, insulation panels. Um, whomever of you build a house, you might be familiar with, of, uh, with these insulation panels. And as they come in one size, there's always quite some cut off because the house you know, has different dimensions, windows, doors, and you name it. The cut off is then still <clears throat> good and new raw material. And yeah, what this application allows, first, um, the construction sites have it, getting the styrodo material, get um, bags with printed on QR code. 
and the construction workers are trained and um, on the M cycle application, and then they put the cutoff of this insulation panels into bags. Um, when the bags are full, close them, and when you have a certain number of bags, then you can use the M cycle app. You scan the QR codes, and then the pickup of the material is arranged, and the material is brought to the recycler, and that's it. And yeah, I guess you don't need so much fantasy. You can apply this scheme to many other applications. And if you look on this application also, you see yeah, not too many partners are involved. The construction site worker, um, the distributor, the logistic um, provider, and then the recycling. That's it. And there's not a lot of data shared. And solutions like this are very useful to start your journey towards this twin transition. But now, Imagine you're talking about way more complex circular products. Imagine you talk about circular washing machines, circular car, you name it. Now you face an endless number of yeah, partners who could be involved. And all these partners in the ecosystem, they need to somehow be able to exchange data. Because if you go towards circularity, you do not only exchange data with the partner in the value chain, uh, before and after you, but you really you need to interact and exchange data across the ecosystem. And everybody comes with different system, different resources, different interests. Uh, next slide, please. And one answer <clears throat> to this um, challenge, and also VSF is, is part of and, and is uh, working with is Catena X. What is Catena X? I'm not sure if you might have heard about it already. Catena X is the first collaborative open data ecosystem to prepare, in this case, the automotive industry for the future. And as you know, chemical industry is delivering into the automotive industry. We are also part of uh, Catena X. Shared goal is a standardized global data exchange based on European values. And main claim here is data sovereignty. You were always you stay the master of your data. Idea is participation is rewarded with above average resilience, um, of course, innovative strengths if you can um, work on such a system. And also, you can imagine also good earning opportunities. And a good message, Catena X is open so other industries and ecosystems can be integrated more or less anytime. And yeah, it's data systems like Catena X, um, they will be the infrastructure really for the future, which allow us to enable scalable circular solution. Without such ecosystem, it's really, it's impossible. And you can see already here on the slide, um, some uh, really only some use case examples, because if you think of it, it's endless. Some are material marketplaces, digital product passports, track and trace tools, you name it. Uh, next slide, please. So, and yeah, you heard main claim, data sovereignty. So your data is your data always. So data is not somewhere uploaded in a cloud or whatever, but the data exchange happens, as you can see here, between two partners in the ecosystem. And yeah, very important also mentioned um, by Sarah is standardized data format. She also, already mentioned, if you don't standardize your data format, you cannot interact, no, no chance. Yeah? And also um, important to mention, the technology is open source. And if you collaborate on such a data ecosystem, also what you can observe, um, that really the mindset also of the stakeholders really develops changes. So you can observe that really the main driver is the collaboration. And between the companies. And also you can observe that yeah, transparency and awareness of the Catena X potential are more and more driving the further development of the solution. There's proactive data exchange and also yeah, really intrinsic motivation because all kind of business models you might have only imagined before, you can now really realize them if you have such a data ecosystem as a base. Next slide, please. And yeah, one interesting use case of Catena X is the digital product passport. And I will only briefly touch this under the data sharing aspect because then 
a speaker after me will go in depth uh, for digital product passports. So what is a digital product passport? It's a regulatory required IT solution which contains various data for the described product. And in Catena X, BSF is driving the work on the battery passport. Um, it's what do you need here? What you see on the picture is the battery passport is issued by the company bringing the battery on the market. But to be able to issue this passport, you need to be able to push the data through the complete value chain. So you need to accumulate the data. And if you want to automate this, then it is only possible in a system described as Catena X. Yeah? Every step in the value chain, the data is standardized, the technology is standardized, all systems are interoperable. Otherwise, you will have no chance to automatically generate this. Next slide, please. And an important enabling technology yeah, is the digital twin for um, such a data system. So the digital twin really represents the essential key technology. It connects the physical world with the digital world and acts as an enabler of the Catena X network. And digital twins have established themselves as a um, central element for structuring and also accessing data. And one example where you can where you need to spend a lot of time to create standardized digital twins, you also need to align on all semantics. And this was quite interesting experience because um, with a traction battery, you could really see that each and every member in the discussion um, first understood something different of what is a battery. Some understood it's the cell, some un understood it's the combination of cells. For some, it was the cells with the housing, for some, the housing plus the cable, and so on. And to be able to use such systems first, you need to go through the exercise and standardize each and every step. And this you need to do for everything. Also, if you want how to calculate, for example, a product carbon footprint, how to forward a carbon product carbon footprint, how to describe the state of health of a battery, and so on. So this is for the first product where you go through this exercise, a huge effort, but you learn passport by passport, so the effort to decrease with the number of existing DPPs. And yeah, while you provide this full transparency, always you need to ensure that every member keeps full data sovereignty and can determine who gets what data and what for. Next slide, please. Yeah, and now I hope uh, that I didn't scare you too much. So while this sounds and looks really super overwhelming at the first glance, if you then imagine you did the work, you have such a system, it opens new opportunities and business models for the future, it opens really an endless field. Next slide, please. Yeah, and with that, thanks for your attention and looking forward for the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Nicole, uh, for this overview and for already introducing the topic of uh, digital product passport, which uh, we're going to talk a lot about, um, which we're also going to hear about from our next speaker. So I'd like to uh, call on stage now uh, Elias Yakovidis from DigiConnect to give us an overview of how the European Commission sees this nexus between the green and digital transition and what are the uh, what is your vision on uh, the role of digital technologies in enabling the 2050 goals Elias the floor is yours thank you good afternoon thank you Maria I'm working in DigiConnect so I'm basically from the digital world but I'm the one that actually started already four years ago this movement that became a priority of our president so I started working before the new president took her job, prepared this strategy and trying to implement that. So as you see, the two green and digital are the two priorities. We will actually just look at it. What is happening today? You are all experiencing because it's reaching you as regulatory work, as initiatives, as requirements, as targets, as promises. The Green Deal. The Green Deal is the mother of all legislations. I mean, it's spitting out every week some legislative or some kind of a uh, 
legislative work or uh, other types of recommendations. So this is really one of the most productive times. And I'm sure that you as CEFIC, but also every company sustainability officer is feeling the heat, how much are, we have produced in uh, Green Deal. Now, in summary, Green Deal is very much about cleaning up and it's not only about emissions because everybody talks about emissions we're talking also about water natural resources we talk about pollution we talk about circular economy so this aspect next slide is what you have seen already this year in the transition pathway so this has been kind of prepared for you as a chemical industry what does it mean this green transition for you and what does it mean green and digital if you go to the executive summary of this document you will see the first sentence is this document is about green digital transition but let me make a point here at the moment is still a lip service people still do not understand what green digital means at the moment we the momentum of the green being on another planet than the digital is so big that it's really hard to get it together and your sector is one of those where this can be actually exemplary how you put it together. Next, on the digital, I'm not saying that we are running behind. So if you look at all our targets, what we want to do, we focus very much on infrastructures, but what dominates the discussion today is the Data Act, AI Act, and you know, of course, the Cyber Act and Chips Act and you name it. So I will actually list them in the next slide. If you see what we produced as a house and what you have to deal with is tremendous. On one hand, you see all the things that we as DigiConnect have produced and are now being discussed in trialogues or with parliament, council and constituency. The same, I just very small sample of what the green part is doing. Now I will challenge you. How much green is there in the digital? And how much digital is there in the green? Sorry about the fingers. Let's go, let's go back once. And the question can go back to your departments. How much of your chief sustainability officer team is meeting on a regular basis the chief technology or chief digital officer team? I would really challenge you to look at that. Are you under the same roof? Are you systemically bringing the technology and research and digital aspects of your company to meet with the sustainability officer, which is mostly scratching its head about reporting. And we have, as you know, public consultation on European sustainability reporting scheme. So we will change some aspects of the reporting. So all that is happening at the same time as we talk. The best example to look at is RRPs recovery and resilient plans. We were we gave 700 billion were spent, 700 billion euro were spent in Europe and 20% had to be spent on digital transition and 37% on green. I challenge you to go and see how much of the digital transition, the chapter on digitalization, how much of greening of digital is there? And more importantly, how much of the digitalization you find in the green transition documents and i challenge you that there will not much so the capacity and i'm not so okay i'm blaming myself as a commission we still don't have the capacity to really systemically infuse and do the nexus the digitalization for the fit for purpose digitalization that you report is highlighting very very well is not yet daily practice in the green transition so the laws that are there about chemical labeling, digital chemical labeling, uh, ROHCs, you know, the REACH type of regulations, are, are, are not using the fit for purpose, latest technology digital, monitoring of environmental uh, deforestations, food uh, farm to fork. There's so much more that digitalization can do that is not yet, the potential is not yet realized fully. Next. So what is the nexus? majority of people I talk to, they say, what nexus? We understand that green digital means that the green and the digital are more equal than the others. So those are the chosen fields. 
So green transition and digital transition are more equal than, let's say, demographic transition. Not that they have to talk, they are just the ones that will pick up the money first and leftovers are for the rest. This is wrong and really bad understanding, but unfortunately we still live with that. Next. So those that say, yes, there is a nexus. Again, majority of those fall in the trap of, yeah, the nexus is that green needs to apply to digital. So there is a footprint of digitalization. That footprint is about 3% of total emissions. There is a lot of e-waste, so there's material inefficiency that is huge just because we as consumers change our mobiles too often and we don't really have the aspects of circularity of electronics yet embedded in the system. But 3% of total emissions is insignificant, but the real potential of digitalization next is to cut 10, 15, 20%. Next. So we are not exploiting the synergy. The synergy means that digital helps green and green helps digital. How does green help digital? Well, the green finance has to come in for digitalization to happen. And that green finance at the moment, digitalization is not on a menu because when I talk to World Bank, they say, well, we don't know if digitalization is sustainable. So we will invest in PV, uh, hydrogen, and some of the basic offshore wind, the things that we know, that we understand. But digitalization, how do we know it's a sustainable fund? So green and digital have to hold hands if there is anything that happens under the label of twin transition. Next. So digitalization is proving case by case and i think your report is very clear because you can see all the powers of digital twins how do i speed up design how do i speed up safety testing i've been working 25 years in healthcare it was all about data exchange you know improving uh, patient care telemonitoring digital twin of patients imaging there's a lot and it, and it's happening but it's not necessarily sustainable so what is the proof that digitalization is sustainable? There is no standard. So while we measure here and there in different sectors, the potentials, we do not have a systemic standard method to say this is the enablement in sustainability. Next. So what do we need is the following. While if you are from the world of LCA, if you are from the sustainability team of your company, you know that you can actually measure the footprint of something real. So you can measure the negative consequences, but we do not know how to measure the positive contribution of digital. There are homegrown calculators that everybody has that do not add up and do not convince politicians. You cannot even issue a green public procurement against this plethora of calculators of enablement. So I personally talk to like, 70 companies next and have created i mean launched this so-called green digital coalition so biggest ict companies have agreed that they will work on standard methodology how to measure net impact the positive enablement cutting emissions from connected mobility or ai for uh, ag you know, precision farming agriculture kind of uh, solutions or smartness of a building for energy efficiency or smart city solutions how do i measure the enablement minus the footprint because every digital solution has a footprint so that difference is a net effect of digitalization next the partnership is growing now we are like 39 companies we started with 26 and I would like to invite you as chemicals because our next step is to invite vertical companies in energy, transport, manufacturing, um, agriculture and others to come in and to start adopting those methods and understanding how to calculate for yourself the enablement, sustainability enablement. Because so far, and it's very transpiring in your report, so far you look at efficiency gains and economic gains. But sustainability is a three-dimensional world. It has economic dimension, social dimension, and environmental dimension. We have as digital partners for the last three decades to 
push the sustainability economic dimension. We are struggling with the social and environmental, and it's about time that we actually start measuring and making sure that we do not harm human rights, social issues, and as well do not harm to environment when we do apply digitalization. So the net effects have to be so that there is at least no harm to all three dimensions. Next. So what the main topic today is what digital can do for circular economy. If I had to choose, if I had only one silver bullet and say digitalization, you have only one area where you can apply to, to do something and to make a difference. That silver bullet would go for digital for circular economy. Enabling circular economy is the most powerful field. And that is because there is, we are really much behind. If you look at some studies, I can, if somebody's interested, I can send that. What is the correlation between increased digitalization and the 17 SDGs? Increasing digitalization helps about 11 of the 17 SDGs. So there is a positive correlation, more digitalization, better achievement towards 11 of the 17 SDGs. Five of them are inconclusive and they are mostly the environmental. We don't really know, it's kind of nebulous. There's no positive vector, uh, it's kind of both ways. But there is one that is negative and that's SDG 12, co responsible co consumption and production. So there is the biggest, lowest, I mean, hanging fruit to make a big difference. And that is, next, next slide. That is where we can make a huge difference digital by really enabling what Nicole and Sarah was talking about, these data exchanges among all the supply chain actors and beyond, resale, resale repair, refurbisher, recycler, in your case, maybe not so much of repair, but every product has a lot of information. I call it the medical record of a product because I worked 25 years trying to create kind of a European standard for electronic health records. So this is the kind of, well, I would say the, the new kit on the blog that excites Europe, the digital product passport. We have such an interest. We had yesterday kind of state of play event. It was thousand people on a WebEx that, our WebEx account can only hold 1,000, it was crashing. There is so much excitement about what exactly is this beast and how are we gonna standardize the exchange, B2B exchange, B2C exchange, B2G exchanges of data around products and materials. Next. So this digital product passport has been introduced in Ecodesign for Sustainable Product Regulation. So we have the articles eight to 12, you can go and look at them. So it's pretty much described, but now we're going into standardization mode of the, what I call, next slide, digital product passport system. There is a slide, we will talk about it in the discussion, so I will not drill on it. Let's come back to it in the discussion when you ask questions about this. But idea is, this is kind of the consumer view that you scan, kind of identify, data carrier, let's say QR code, can be NFC, can be RFID, can be barcode you go and you may actually have something already possible to read offline from the QR code itself. And also to make sure that this is authentic uh, product. So you, so there's a counterfeit uh, kind of uh, system that you can check that this is a authentic product. Then it goes to the website of the manufacturer, which actually can link you to the website of the supplier. It is quite complex. I don't have time to go through it but member states are asking that we do a registry of digital product passports for all the products that we will regulate with the eco design. So they also can do kind of an indexing and search on materials. My vision would be like, for example, we have heard about Katina X and battery passport, which is quite far with respect to other product categories with textiles, is to have product categories that will be actually separate delegated act. So what will be in the digital product passport will be subject to a delegated act, secondary legislation. But all the product passports, and let's go to the next slide, that's easier too. All the product passports will have to have something in common. And that is how you authenticate yourself as a, an actor, as an economic actor. How do you authenticate yourself as a you know recycler, supply chain man manufacturer? How do you separate the, um, how do you identify the products? 
how do you store the products? There are some things that you see on the left-hand side that will have to be standardized across all product categories. And then on the right-hand side is the choice, what do I want to capture when I talk about chemicals X or detergents or cosmetics? So I will have to actually decide with the constituency what we're going to capture, who can see what, and which standards we're going to apply to these materials and figures, data. And I hope that there will be a lot of cross product category standardization because ultimately it could be policymakers that are saying how much of lithium is today circulating in products such as battery, electronics, construction, and others. So there is some kind of a planning what will hit the recycler plan, or it can be aluminum, what will hit the recycler plants and how much of secondary material can come back to me as a manufacturer and how much do I need to import from outside. So beyond kind of sustainability of a product, there are also things that we want to do with materials. And most importantly, we would like to change the business model. And this is kind of a question back to Sarah. One thing that was not mentioned is the following. Today's economy runs on quantity driven business models, more materials, chemicals, pesticides, fertilizers I sell, more money I make. Can you, in some of the selected product categories that you have, turn it around and to be in the mode of product as a service? So can you go to the farmers and say, instead of selling you chemicals, I'm selling you a service of plant protection. I want X amount per hectare. It is my job to apply the chemicals when and if needed. You will become digital companies no time because you will need to buy drones, IoT, AI to analyze all the data. And you will need to go and spend as little as possible of the chemicals to make sure that you have some profit. So this is a challenge question maybe for the discussion. So I stop here. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Elias, for uh, for this great, uh, also for challenging us and for providing this uh, interesting perspective on the nexus between green and digital. I'm sure we, we can discuss this further during our um, Q&A session. So I'm just going to um, pass the floor to our next and last speaker, to Federico Mena, CEO of EIT Digital. Federico, thanks for joining us. Uh, so obviously no discussion about digital transformation uh, is possible without a discussion about digital skills and entrepreneurial skills. So could you let us know what uh, your thoughts are on this topic? Yes, thank you very much, Maria, and, and thank you for, for the invitation. Yeah, I will try to be brief and then I can elaborate more in the in the in the discussion later on so i'm the ceo of the eit digital which is one of the nine uh, uh, knowledge and innovation communities of the european institute of innovation and technology and it the name says it all so we are the the ones dealing with digital transition uh, to give you some numbers uh, uh, we've been established in 2010 so we are turning 13 soon uh, we have uh, so far graduated more than 3,000 students uh, at master level within um, uh, within our 17 universities on deep tech uh, topics, combining uh, deep tech with entrepreneurship and innovation. We have a portfolio of 250 companies uh, where uh, we are actively investing in those companies and we support uh, another 200 companies approximately to raise funds uh, through private capital. And so far we raised uh, 1.3 uh, billion for them. And also we are more and more engaging in uh, private and public uh, uh, collaborations. Uh, uh, this is a more recent activity that started a couple of years ago and we already mobilized about 100 million uh, euro for our community. And our community, is, you see at the bottom of the email, of the, of the, of the slide, is about 350 partners, which are corporates, SMEs, universities, and RTOs. So while we are not directly involved in the in, in, in the chemical industry, we see more and more uh, that uh, the the digital transition and the green transition are strongly uh, connected. And we see more and more partners coming to us for this type of activities. And the in the in the next slide, I will tell you a bit more uh, 
what uh, what we do. So we are an ecosystem. I, ju I, I just mentioned. We are. Uh, you see some numbers that I mentioned before. We are present in 21 cities across Europe. Uh, soon 22. We are expanding to Romania, and we also have a office in Silicon Valley. And on top of this ecosystem, if you go one more and another one, we build a, a educational program. And this is where already you see one of the elements that were mentioned before. Uh, there is no innovation without education. So it's really important when dealing with the green transition, when dealing with the digital transition, and when dealing with the combination of the two, uh, to have uh, skilled people. And that means professionals. Uh, we do that through our master school, for example. So we really train the, the next generation of future leaders know, that are able to know and master technology, but also mastering uh, innovation and entrepreneurship. But it's also important to upskill our professionals, you know, uh, especially in industries that are more traditional. It's important that the workforce uh, is not left behind and keep the pace of the transformation. So it's really important also in order to make sure that we have the right people in the right place. We often hear the comment that technologies will uh, not will uh, create job displacement. Uh, it's only partly true because now every entrepreneur you talk to is saying that uh, he or she cannot find enough skilled workforce. So the main issue is not about job displacement, it's rather about upskilling and reskilling. And in education, on top of having technical uh, professionals able to master entrepreneurship and innovation and upskilling and reskilling professionals, it's also important to ensure that we, at the level of the uh, population, we ensure that there is a basic understanding of knowledge. So that means that from primary school already, we would need to in, teach the basics of cybersecurity, AI, machine learning, and so forth. So that's extremely important. So we don't need a, a population of 100% uh, 100 of the population to be super technical, but we need a basic understanding. It's crucial in any sector of economy and society. So that's the first pillar. And then we have the innovation. So I was asked uh, in the intro to cover the startup and entrepreneurial part, and that's exactly what our innovation pillar is about. The innovation pillar is about bringing uh, entrepreneurs together to uh, work on them, with them on their ideas and help them build in their company. And that's what we do with the venture program. So we really take entrepreneurs together, work with them through boot camps, uh, ideation sessions, and help them bring an idea into a product, into a company, of which we also then become shareholders. And uh, in, uh, in, uh, as part of that uh, program, then we, we help companies uh, grow uh, after the, the end of the program and enter into the additional uh, programs that you find below. So the Open Innovation Factory and the Accelerator that cover the other parts of the funnel. So when the company starts getting traction and can work through Open Innovation Program with our corporates, and uh, uh, and then later on when they are ready to raise uh, private funding through series a and series b rounds and that's what we do with our accelerator and again here the same that i said before the green digital uh, element is becoming more and more prominent we have one of the most recent successes that we celebrated with our accelerator is a company from spain uh, called Mitiga, who actually applies uh, digital technologies for uh, climate uh, uh, risk prevention. So they really use data to analyze and prevent disasters. Uh, uh, on the Open Innovation Factory, we were approached by, by FedEx, the logistic player, to run open innovation programs in Europe around the green uh, digital, green logistic infrastructure. So this is becoming more and more um, common and uh, that therefore it's uh, it's extremely important that we 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 combine the more traditional industry with also entrepreneurs and skilled uh, uh, skilled entrepreneurs and startups or even scale ups next slide please yeah this is just to show the ecosystem i think in the interest of time we can skip it just shows in a nice way that essentially we are across europe and uh, we 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 have a few numbers that you said you so before and this is an another way essentially what i said before so um we really cover the whole value chain from a student to a unicorn so from a student 
that in our master school has a has his or her first ideas about entrepreneurship and then all over uh, the incubation acceleration growth services we have these companies uh, to scale up until they, they make the first exit and become unicorns and at any level of this uh, other partners or players can join so we don't necessarily need to have our students going from entrepreneurship to growth but we also allow corporates to join our acceleration and open innovation programs to work uh, with the best startups uh, dealing with a specific uh, topic and that's where for example we were uh, engaging with corporates looking for green digital solutions so i think in the interest of time and to leave time for discussion uh, this is a what we do and how we can help uh, the the, chemi the 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 chemical industry in uh, in in the transition one thing that is not on the slide we also developed a report on uh, green digital technologies you can find it on the it digital website and if any of you is interested we can follow up offline thank you maria back to you mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Federico. Um, we've got less than 15 minutes left for our Q&A. Um, and apologies for being a little bit late, but the, the presentations have been so content rich that we thought it's really important to give everybody a chance to listen to our speakers. So we've got time for some questions. Um, I think there is a question about data sharing, which obviously uh, worries uh, a lot of our members. So the question is, and maybe it's for, for Nicole and Sarah to start and maybe for Elias to also add, is about the um, industrial symbiosis, how you see, you know, breaking the silos of chemical companies uh, with other stakeholders, energy logistics consumers, how do you see this whole ecosystem uh, shared data with, with each other to create this, let's say, shared data space um, and what needs to be done to also encourage uh, chemical companies to share data with, with other stakeholders. Nicole, would you like to respond to this yeah. first? Yeah, I think chemistry, yeah, chemical industry needs to be very, very motivated because actually in, in the end we are sitting like the spider in the web in the middle between all industries because we deliver products into nearly all industries so who if not we should have the utmost interest um, that there are systems and ideally large um, data sharing ecosystems which can which can be used because um, we need to use them all, nearly than all it finally yeah? we deliver everywhere so i don't know if i answered um, this sufficiently or are you missing an aspect or <laughs> Um, well, let's see you maybe uh, the rest of the panel. Uh, Sarah, would you like to comment or Ilias? Yeah, so I think uh, ultimately, um, you know, uh, transparency is important to us because uh, the the public is is demanding uh, a certain amount of transparency around the materials that we're that we're selling. So uh, you know, echoing Nicole's uh, point, this is something that's 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 necessary. That there is uh, challenges, though, in uh, in navigating full transparency because of uh, concerns about you know uh, people owning their data and uh, intellectual property concerns. So I think it needs to be uh, navigated in the ways that the the sharing environment is structured, and um, <clears throat> there's a certain amount of uh, of data inf information that uh, that ultimately uh, companies will, I think, want to retain as their own. Can Thank I you. mention mm -hmm. two two things? First is that you and Nicole said it. You have a responsibility not only as an industry to follow your greening path, huh? so your pathway to net zero. That's important for you. But you have an extra responsibility as a sector to help the others to green because you are in the middle as of that web and you are providing materials based on which the others sustainability of the other sectors depend so that's one thing second don't yet confuse what we talk about when we talk about digital product passport which is about the sustainability of that specific product category with chemical industry data space or manufacturing data space or mobility data space. So there are many data spaces that we help to create as DigiConnect. Data space 
is very complex undertaking and at the moment it's very nebulous concept that confuses people if i had to add one thing is do not give that data space strategy to one person because the data space is something like a hamburger visually where the top bun is the governance the bottom bun is the interoperability what we do with the simple i don't know if you know but you know there's cloud infrastructure so basic data space interoperability the plumbing but the meat is the data from that sector that's yours but there is no person that would understand the legal and the ipr protection and all the gdpr and the smart contract understanding of what governance means at the same time, understanding the very complex computer science, bottom up, bottom kind of interoperability gains, and the data analysts of that sector. That cannot be done by one person. It needs a whole team because it needs very specific and very divergent knowledge uh, background. Okay. Thank you very much. And on this, on this point, I think on digital product passports, we also have a question here um asking you know how long until those product passports uh, will be widespread in the manufacturing and what are they supposed to achieve uh, at the end of the of the day correct that's an excellent question mm -hmm. so digital product passport has been introduced last year now we are standardizing how the system will work so that when there is a trilogue agreement by parliament and council hopefully in the spring of next year we will start we will already have a either specs by commission or harmonized standards on the DPP system. So we go into product category one at a time. Knowing my colleagues in DigiNR, Agro and Envy, we will have maybe capacity to do two or three product categories per year. So we do delegated acts for textiles, for detergents, for chemicals, for you know furniture, for whatever product category we choose as the top priority. And we design what is the eco design criteria for that product, product category and what is the DPP to contain. That will take an out, another year. And then we, we will give a year and a half for market to take over. So we start with the batteries, which is a separate regulation in 27. So it will, DPPs will hit the market as of 27 or later and two, three per year, as I said, category. So it will take some time because eco-design will be a slow process. I personally hope that after we do several product categories, we will take the product passport as a mechanism and let the industry do it even before we touch them with the eco-design criteria, because it is mostly for B2B efficiency, administrative burden to have as one single point of truth about this material sustainability origin whatever you want to capture plus voluntary data in the product passport so you do automatic reportings and uh, you know conformity testings and change the business model so it's about two things making the product sustainable but for me even more importantly moving to more sustainable business models moving away from quantity driven business models that is the ultimate goal of dpp to support thank you Elias. and uh returning to your previous point uh that you mentioned about indeed new business models and chemicals as service so maybe that's also a good time to also come back to this and uh, obviously asking uh sarah nicole to maybe give us some examples of whether you're already thinking in your companies about um, this kind of services and how you see the you know interplay between chemicals as services and digital transition. Yeah, so maybe I'll jump in. I, I think that uh, logically we can uh, we can see that uh, as we invest in the systems and we create the the data, we have the opportunity to do uh, new business models. And, and I, I think, Ilias, what you're referring to, I would call it dematerialization uh, as as one of the options that you're you're actually taking the power of the data to uh, to solve different problems than those that you just solve with the product uh, alone. 
Um, but I do think that we are, uh, it's, it's a very aspirational and ultimately uh, a place that we will likely go. But I think that we are in the very early stages of thinking about th those kinds of options. I've actually been reading a, a very interesting book uh, recently uh, called Power and Prediction, The Disruptive Economics of Artificial Intelligence. It's um, by three economists from the University of Toronto. And they uh, they use the analogy that uh, digitalization and particularly AI is a lot like the uh, the use of electricity at the beginning of the industrial revolution. That you you start with uh, point solutions until over time uh, uh, new solutions come forward that uh, that truly are more disruptive in the way that uh, ecosystems work together. So you go from more incremental extending and digitalizing what you already do to the creation of new approaches and, and new models. And I think for our sector, we are very much at, at the beginning of that journey. We are in those the, that, the early stages akin to electrification. And Maybe I, I can add, I, I see this, I mean, new business models and what is possible, we definitely should focus on because this is a chance and this is a danger. Because you mentioned chemistry as a service, but you could imagine everything could be yeah, a service. Also the products before and after us could be then as a service. And we have to decide what is our role in this yeah, growing upcoming ecosystem, who, do we want to be and we need to work towards this position because otherwise other partners in the eco um, system will decide before us and will already claim certain positions and will bring us in the position that we can only react yeah if then for example the supplier of our raw material decides oh no i provide my material no longer you can buy it it's only you can rent it yeah then it, it, it happened. So this is very important that we start very early and per industry we, we are active in. What is our position now? And but what is our position in the future? Because this will definitely be disrupted if we undergo this dual transition. Yeah. Thanks, Nicole. Um, I think we have uh, time for only one more question and I'm going to pose this maybe to Marina as our industry expert. So we've heard today extensively about artificial intelligence, about digital product passports, about digital twins, but are there any other technologies or trends that receive less airtime but you still think they're quite significant and they may actually have a significant influence on the rate of digitalization in the chemical industry moving forward. Right, so um, obviously uh, among the uh, trends uh, in the coming years, we will obviously see artificial intelligence and digital twins uh, data sharing mechanisms, but uh, among the technologies that uh, hasn't been, haven't been mentioned uh, extensively uh, today is uh, robotics and uh, automation. And uh, this bring, um, extreme value uh, in uh, production uh, at the production sites. Uh, so uh, drones can be used for inspection uh, from uh, the heights and uh, robots uh, for uh, autonomous inspections, inspections um, uh, in the areas uh, which are difficult for people to reach and uh, probably also uh, immersive uh, technologies um, also um, adopted in um, production uh, sites that uh, could uh, increase collaboration and uh, remote uh, monitoring uh, of the um, environments and uh, actual um, production parameters. And uh, if I can touch uh, upon quickly uh, about uh, high computing capacity, uh, so the um, there are quite a few uh, companies uh, in the chemical sector already looking into the uh, quantum computing. And uh, in the coming years, uh, this number uh, is expected to uh, double because uh, quantum computing uh, will have um, a great potential uh, in uh, the uh, chemical sector. And uh, the uh, computations and simulations that uh, have been uh, 
not uh, been possible uh, nowadays uh, can be uh, done in a matter of minutes. And this would be an exciting and fantastic uh, breakthrough for the industry. So this is uh, definitely uh, the uh, technology uh, to watch uh, together with the supercomputing. Maria, if I can just second mm -hmm. the last, I'm sure. talking to some quantum computing companies and they are doing on a molecular or even atomic level simulations of nitrogen absorption or kind of the qualities of pesticides and trying to find out the best uh, variations. So there is a computational chemistry that you can do with quantum that you could never do before, even how a batteries work on atomic level. So that is in the potential where at least large chemical companies should look at because the applications are planned to come out like by 2025, 27. Yeah, thanks everybody. I mean, so and so exciting. I think we definitely have enough content to have, you know, webinars on digital technologies every week uh, to just cover the, the sheer breadth of, of all the technologies that are being deployed in our industry now. But unfortunately, we're coming to an end of our webinar. And I just want to ask uh, my colleague and uh, our executive director of innovation, Daniel Without, maybe just to summarize the discussion. Daniel, you have one minute. What are the one key takeaway that uh, the audience should take with them home after this very content rich webinar. Yeah, thank you very much, Maria, and, and thank you uh, to all the panelists for this excellent and very inspiring conversation. I think to, to summarize this up within less than one minute, it's, uh, it's a task I, I cannot do. I'm really impressed and inspired by so many things that I would like to follow up uh, with you. Um, I, I like the, the uh, comparison with electricity. I think we made already some, some good progress, have uh, great achievements already, but I think there's a a lot of potential down the road and I'm convinced uh, that the importance of the technologies that were mentioned here today uh, will increase and um, that the full potential um, is not not yet there but in order to, to leverage the full potential of these technologies I invite you all to engage in the conversation with us uh, be it a wherever your, your background is coming from, from civic members or, or policy makers, um, please engage with us. So let's work together to leverage the full potential of digital technologies for a sustainable future that we all aspire to achieve. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for this uh, very inspiring concluding remarks. And thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, thanks to our speakers and please stay tuned for more webinars from the CEFIC team. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye.